I want you to look at this picture and a answer the following questions. As you look at these faces, which of them are rich, which are poor? Which are honest, which are dishonest? Which are college educated, which are high school dropouts? Which are upstanding citizens and which are convicted felons? Could you tell the difference? This is the reason you probably couldn't because most time you have to make a snap judgment. This is a test that they use to judge a person's prejudice. Just by the sheer appearance of something, you make a judgment upon character that seems to stick in your mind. And it has seemed to be ramping up quickly. Years ago, when the poet Carl Sandburg had finished his long career as an old man, he had went to a university in Chicago where he gave a lecture. The university students asked him a question, at least one did. What is the ugliest word in the English language? Sandberg had a mastery of the English language. He could use his tongue as a brush and paint the picture with the words that he used. He stopped for a moment and thought, and in his usually gravelly voice he said, the ugliest word the ugliest word, the ugliest word is exclusive. And James would agree with, with his sentiments. There is nothing so bad in the church as being exclusive. Of deciding that some are worthy and some are not, that some are good and some are bad, based upon what you see on their outside. And so James wants to tackle a problem that we would love to think has long past gone, but it's not. It's still here. It's still here just as, all, all, uh, just as current as the cold weather came in this morning. It's the problem of prejudice, and it's the problem of prejudice in the church. James begins in James chapter 2 with the term my brothers. He says, let's talk about this because we're family. And if how do families function? How do families feel about each other? How does a family treat each other? So, my brothers, let's talk about this. And then he says, show no partiality as you hold faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. He really says, stop doing this. That's the language he used. Stop showing partiality. Now, partiality is one of those words that we, we kind of confuse. We do have some partial things. We're more partial to our friends than our just acquaintances. If you go out to eat, you may, you'll ask certain people, but not others. Not because you're excluding them, but because you didn't think about them. That's not partiality, at least according to James. He uses the term that means to, to lift up the face. It, it's like if someone were to come into a worship service and, and they were a celebrity. I, uh, several years ago, uh, we had a member here who had passed away and at his funeral, he was a big supporter of Oklahoma State athletics. I mean, big supporter. And so in the audience was T. Boone Pickens. And everybody fawned over T. Boone Pickens. And it's almost like said, we have as our honored guest today, and they, they raised their hand, and here I am. And that's partiality. They're more important than someone else. They're more famous than you are, therefore they get more attention. James could have done that. You know, James has this unusual position. He is the brother of Jesus. Now, what's interesting in chapter 1, he, ends, he begins his book by saying, Jesus, uh, James, a servant of Jesus Christ. That's all he says about himself. Think about what he could have done. Well, 
Do you know I am the brother of Jesus? You want to know when he, what he did when he was 16 years old? I know. Now, you, you, you just heard about him. I live with him. I, you know, I just, man, you pump up your chest and you throw yourself out. And you have some sort of esteem because of, of who you are. But James does none of that. He doesn't even mention he's the brother of Jesus. And he says that if you're going to hold faith in Jesus Christ, you can't be partial. Because people who are partial don't have the faith that they need. And if you have the faith, you won't do this. But then he says, are you sure about that you don't? So he says, let's go to church. He said, I've been in your assemblies. Let's suppose there are two men that come into your assembly. And I imagine this has happened. There's first of all a poor man. He's dirty. He works all day long. He doesn't have new clothes or even better clothes. The clothes he wears every day are the only clothes he owns. He may smell some. He comes into the church service and they have a nearsighted, at least a spiritually nearsighted usher who says, oh, it's you again. Well, come here. See right there? Why don't you sit right there and try not to keep, get anybody dirty and don't make any noise because we don't want to be embarrassed. But then there's another man. It says he is a, he's wearing a gold ring. Actually, it doesn't say that. It says he's wearing a gold ring on every finger. He's a many-ringed person. He's got a ring on everything. He can afford the fineries life. He has the goodness of life. He is, the, he is the, the banker of town, or he is the accountant of town, or he's the mayor of town. And so when he comes in, he's got this nice white robe. It says fine clothing. It really means something that sparkles like the sun. He has slaves to keep his clothes clean. They wash it, and they press it, and they make sure it's as white as the sun. And he comes in, and the usher says, Oh, we are so honored to have you with us. Here, here come, come here, follow me. I'm going to give you a good seat. You come over here. You see, this row, this seat here, this is, this is the prime seat. This is the one that, that we use for, our, for our, our cherished guest, and we want you to have this seat. And it is so wonderful to have you in our service today. You see, that's what he says in those verses. Now, you have to understand what it really looks like. They probably used pretty much the configuration of the synagogue. And this is a, a rendition of what has been excavated from Capernaum, the synagogue where Jesus would preach from time to time. And you can come in and you can see there are benches to where you can sit comfortably without problem, but then there's this open floor. So when the benches fill out, the people who come late sit on the floor. And what James is portraying is that those who have the wealth, those who have the importance, are given the good seats, while the people who are not important are given the dirt of the floor, and they are so low that the rich people could have rested their feet upon their backs, their footstools. This is an interesting problem because what James says, you have made distinctions among yourselves and have become judges with evil thoughts. He says you've got motives that, are just, that just stink. You've made some decisions about people with the motives that you shouldn't have. In George Orwell's fable or parable called Animal Farm, he tells a story of the revolt of animals against a farmer. And uh, the first great tenet of their new life is all animals are equal. Toward the end of the book, the pigs have taken over and everyone else becomes subservient to them and they change the first rule to 
all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. That seems to be what James is getting at here, that some are more equal than others. Because you look at people and say, what can that person do for me? It is the ego of being important and the advantage that you can gain from them. It was a problem in the church. It's been a problem in the church forever. We've had made, made distinctions a long time. If you go back a hundred years and look at old sermons, you'll find that in the Deep South, some of our pulpits had sermons that said people of color were not made in the image of God, but were animals. I sometimes wonder how you can open a Bible and come to that conclusion. The answer is because you are judges with evil thoughts. Your motives are all wrong. You're trying to elevate yourself above someone else. It was a problem in the first century church as well. Peter, in Acts 10, goes to Cornelius' house. He has to be persuaded, and we're going to see that in a moment. But as he goes to Cornelius' house, he crosses that Gentile threshold, he preaches the gospel to him, he baptizes him into Christ, he eats at his table, and he goes back to Jerusalem, and he is he in hot water. They have heard what Peter did, and oh, you don't do things like that in the church. Those filthy goyim, those filthy Gentiles over there, you ate with them, and you did what? You baptized them? They haven't jumped through the Jewish hoops yet. They haven't cleansed themselves. They're still dirty. So they call Paul on the car Peter on the carpet, and their complaint is, you ate, you went to circum uncircumcised men and ate with them. Do you hear the distinction? Circumcised and uncircumcised, Jew and Gentile, worthy and unworthy. We are superior. We are God's chosen people. They're not. Why bother? And it looks like Peter would have learned this lesson. You know, usually when you get whipped by someone else, you've learned a lesson. Sometimes the only lesson you learn is don't put yourself in that position again. And that's what he learned. Because when you come to Galatians chapter 2, <clears throat> Peter goes to Antioch. Antioch is that great church that has opened the gospel to the Gentile world. <clears throat> the very first that seems to have a grasp on the fact that God's grace is for all, not just for some. And so he goes there and, and he's having a wonderful time. He's, he's eating with them. They fellowship together. But then there are those guys who come from Jerusalem again. And he saw them, and he could feel the sting of the criticism the first time. So he picked up his plate, and he moved to a different table to eat with them so he wouldn't eat with the Gentiles. Paul had had enough of that. He gives him a tongue lashing he would never forget. You have played the hypocrite. You separated yourself from them because you made a judgment about their worthiness in front of all these other people. How dare you? That's the problem. And we would like to think we outgrew that. That that's not really a problem today. But it is. And I know it because it happened to me. In our first work, we had, a, we had this itty-bitty little church out in the middle of nowhere that had great dreams without any money. We had a budget, but we might as well not have had a budget. You know, somebody says, can you break down the budget? Well, the budget broke down every Sunday. There was never any money. And they usually balance the budget on my salary. I found that out pretty fast. <clears throat> and so one day, as we're there having worship, 
the head elder comes. And by the way, every church has a head elder. You learn that in ministry. And, and so the head elder comes up, and he sidles up next to me. He says, you see these people there? You know, th there's that guy in that nice suit. Now, he had a suit on while everybody else had their overalls and flannel shirts on. You could tell who the visitor was. He said, you see that guy in suit? And you see his wife, how well she's dressed? They've got money. You need to go see them this week because they'd really help our budget. Made my skin crawl. Oh, I wish that Paul had showed up that morning so I could have said, sick them. <laughs> you see, that's current. <clears throat> it happens all, all the time. Maybe not that bold. But when you look around our auditorium, you'll see there are people we go, just that way. Very subtle. We don't want to say they're not worthy, but we want to say they're not as worthy as someone else. And so it is that James has to put this thing together and say, let's look at this. This is what's going on. This is what's wrong with what you're doing. So he says, let's go ahead then and, and see how you're going to... He, he holds them up to a mirror. Now, there are a lot of ways <clears throat> to confront people. You can go at them hammer and tong. You know, I know preachers, they aim sermons. Probably the most foolish thing in the world because the fellow who needs it doesn't hear it, and the people who don't need it have heard it. And they feel bad about not doing what he's telling them they've not done. So instead, the best way is to say, well, let's, let's look. Let's see what, what we're doing. Let's, let's look at what you're, we're thinking. You, you may be right. I don't know. But let's look at least. So he holds up a mirror and has them look in the mirror. I want to ask you a question. Ask yourself some questions. And he says, listen, my brothers. Uh, the English Standard Version is much too polite. James doesn't say that. He says, you better listen to me or I'm going to yank you by the, by the hair of your head and, and, and knock some sense into you. Listen. That's what it says. And so he says, let's look at what your practice and what it's doing and how it's going. He said, has God not chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? Now, don't mistake what James says. He doesn't say because you are rich, because you are poor, you are righteous. Nothing could be further than the truth. But the reality is that <clears throat> Rich people have a harder time with faith. They are much more self-reliant. They can buy what they want, take care of themselves. When Jesus looked at the back of the head of the rich young ruler as he left sorrowfully, he shook his head and he said, it is, it is hard for, the, for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Because they say to themselves, we have many goods laid up for many years. It's harder to get the rich because they don't need the gospel as much as the poor who need it all the time. And so he says, who exactly is the one that we're trying to reach? Who are the ones rich in faith? Is it the, is it the rich man or is it the poor man? God wants people who are rich in faith, not, not rich in, in wealth. So he says, so now tell me, when you see the poor man on the ground, what are you saying about his faith? But he goes on to ask another question. He says, have you not dishonored him? And he says, I want you to think of what's going on in your lives. He says, are not the rich ones, the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court, are not the one who blaspheme the holy honorable name to which you were called? He says, Joe, let me ask you a question. Last week, when someone drug you into the court and they took your house to make a parking lot out of it, was that a rich man or a poor man? Was he the one that was here last Sunday? <clears throat> Why do you think he's so special if he takes your house? Or he says, Susan, you know your brother. He got hauled before the magistrates last week. He was told he better 
say Caesar is Lord or he's going to be beaten. And he came home bloody. Now who did that? Was it the rich man that we thought was so grand? What was he doing to you that he made that happen? What are you doing elevating these people who, are, who seem to be against you all the time? Doesn't that seem inconsistent that you would do that? Why do it? If they're hurting you, why do you say they are important or they're better? Do you really think that by giving them favorable treatment, you will change their opinion of you? The answer is self-apparent. And he says, are you keeping the royal law? He tells you what it is. A law fit for the king, a law that comes down straight from the king's throne. The royal law, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The lawyers asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, I won't tell you one, I'll tell you two. Love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, strength, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the royal law. That's the one that comes straight from the throne of the king. That's the one that is the edict that you keep above all things. He said, are you doing that? If you are, you're doing well. But is that what you're doing? When you treat the poor differently than you treat the rich, how can you say you're loving your neighbor as yourself? Would you want to trade places with them? Would you want to feel that? Would you want to be treated that way? If you'll do well, if, when you do well, you'll keep the law. Are you keeping that law? Are you loving them as you would be treated? If when they came into church, if you came into church and they said, sit over there, get out of the way. Would you come back next Sunday? If you wouldn't do it, why would you treat them? Because you now know what they feel. Then he asked the question, is the word really working in your life? See, in the first chapter, he talked about be not hearers of the word only, but doers. He says you look into, into the mirror and it informs you of how you're doing. He said, so is the word working in your life when you do this? Is that obeying God? Is that doing what God wants you to do? He says, what do you think God thinks about all this? He says, if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the laws of the transgressors. Oh, those are ugly, ugly words. You see, sometimes we sit back and we say, well, it's not really that bad. It doesn't ever say you shouldn't. And, and I think that's not as bad as it sounds. It's not in fact, we use comparisons and say, at least I didn't kill anybody. Well, bully for you. You did something just as wrong. You see, no matter what you get around, the explanation of God is partiality is still a three-letter word called sin. It's still violating and getting off the path that He wants you to be on. He will not let you get away with some sort of an esoteric philosophical argument that said there are ways to justify this and baptize it and make it holy and say it's really okay because we're doing it for the right reasons. We're really trying to help the church. He says you're not going to help the church by doing what's wrong. So he says are you keeping the word? Because it all comes down to God's standards are yours. When we show partiality we're using our standards how we feel about things. Are you using your standards or God's standards? God has a standard. It has nothing to do with what we see from somebody else. That was a lesson that Peter had to learn. You see, when he gets upbraided, it's because he learned a very valuable lesson back in Joppa. He's there on that rooftop, rooftop and the Lord leads down the, lets down this sheet and in it are armadillos 
and eels and a hog and a couple buzzards. And God says, take a big juicy bite. No, Lord, I haven't ever eaten anything that's unclean. And God says, what I have made clean, you don't call unclean. You don't have the right to determine what's clean and unclean because I'll tell you what it is. Three times it took Peter to get that lesson. It always takes Peter three times to learn lessons. I don't know if you've thought about that. He's hard-headed and slow. <clears throat> and so, there is, he says, this is, God doesn't see things as man sees them, which is what Samuel learned. Samuel he was disappointed with Saul. Saul looked like such a good prospect. And he looked the king, he acted the part of the king, except he had the spiritual deficiency of not wanting to obey God and wanting to do his own thing. So God ranks, yanks the, the kingdom from his hands and says, Samuel, it's time to look for another king. So Samuel goes to Jesse's house. When he goes to Jesse's house, he does the same thing he would have always done, that we would have done. He wants to say, line them up according to height and age. There they are. Boy, he looks like a good one. God says, not, not him. Well, okay, but he's, he's, he's pretty good too. No, not him. And he goes through all these kids, and God says, are you kidding me? I didn't send you to any of those people. They're not going to be the king. And Samuel's run out of boys. I mean, do you have anybody else? Are they hidden in a closet somewhere? Do you keep them away from people so they won't see them? Well, I've got this son, but in Jesse's, I've got this son, but he, he, he's out with the sheep. You know, he don't want him. He's just a ruddy little run of a kid, and he's not going to, he's not a king. Well, God says, I need to see him. So he brings him in, and God's whispering in his ear. The Lord, do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature because I've rejected them. For the Lord sees not as man sees. But he who looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God didn't care how tall the king was going to be. He only cared about how deep his spirit was. He wanted a man who would depend on him, who had experience with him, who had the faith in him, who could, who could conquer more than giants. He could conquer the problems of the world with God's wisdom in his heart. God says, I don't care what the outside looks like because that's irrelevant. I want to know what the heart is like. And we think we are good judges of character, but we're not. It's easy to miss the heart and what it says, and what it's like. So it is that when we come to this moment, you find out that you cannot hold faith in, in God at the same time you're judging other people. Because you're letting other people and their appearance get in the way of how God sees. And if we judge others when ju God is judging us, how in the world can we hold faith that we are capable of making those decisions? We're not. As good as we think we are, as, as confident as we think we are, we can't see what God sees. So you treat everybody the same because God will know who, who they are at that moment. And then you have to ask the question, when God judges you, <clears throat> do you want to use your, stand, your standards on you? Does He want Him to use your standards on you? If God's going to come and judge you, and He says, okay, here's what I think we're going to do. Here, we're going to let you discern, determine how I ought to pronounce judgment. I watched you in this life, and this is what you did. That's what I'll do to you, too. And we say... I don't like that. I don't want that. I need mercy, as James would say. And he said, then why didn't you extend it? Why didn't you show that to other people? 
Why did you think that you were capable enough to say, you go sit on the floor over here, but we're going to elevate you? It's not the same. Well, you see, you come to that moment where that's what's going to happen. I'll never forget, I was a boy of about six. We went to a, a little church on Galisteo Avenue in Santa Fe, New Mexico. One of those churches that didn't have elders, didn't have very good preachers either, so leadership was thin. But the few folks that settled there were faithful. My mother was my Bible class teacher. I remember we had this, this other kid that would come, and he would always be dropped off in front of the church building. He'd scurry into the church building and, and go uh, to Bible class, and during church he'd kind of just sit there and, with somebody else and be quiet. He always had dirty clothes. His hair was never combed. He didn't look like everybody else. One night, his ride didn't come to game. My mother said, we'll take you home. He said, no, that's okay, I'll walk. It's dark. My mother wouldn't hear of that. She said, no, get in the car, I'm taking you home. She was very persuasive. So I hopped in the back seat with him, and she started asking him, where do you live? And he kind of mumbles, and he said, turn here. Okay, now turn here. Now, now, now go this way. He never would look. And he was never very vocal. He had his head bowed the whole time. I found us in the side of town I'd never been in. We pulled up on a street that had a cul-de-sac, and we pulled in front of the house. The house was falling down. The roof needed repair. Windows were broken. Bushes were overgrown. The grass hadn't been cut in months. The boy said, I'm okay. I'll hop out and go. My mother said, no, no, no. I want to make sure somebody's home with you. She was suspicious. So I got out of the car with her. And we went up to the door, and the boy opened the door, and the house was an absolute disaster. It was dirty. There were piles of stuff everywhere. It was dark. I remember looking in, but I could see a figure. It was a man in a wheelchair, slumped and drawn. When I became an adult, I realized that was called quadriplegia. He had been injured, couldn't work. So his wife worked three jobs just to put enough food on the table and keep a roof over their head, even a roof that wasn't worth keeping. It's all they had. My mother said, is there anybody here to take care of? She said, well, my mom's here. About that time, we heard the rustling. And the mother came out of the bedroom. She said, I'm so sorry. I got home and I was so tired, I laid down and I fell asleep. And I forgot to come get him. But I remember the whole time we were going toward his house, the little boy said, I don't want anybody to see where I live. He was embarrassed, he was ashamed. And when we left that house, I remember thinking to myself, there are really people like this. And if God can love them, why can't we?